morning. Today we have uh, a, a real voice, uh, not only to um, our church, but really to the nation. George Acevedo grew up in this church, and he is an incredible influence in our nation. Yeah, put your hands together and welcome him. Uh, I first met George almost 15 years ago. And when I accepted the position here uh, at then Pine Castle United Methodist Church, uh, they sent me to a, a two-week boot camp in Lakeland. And for two weeks, uh, I sat from 8 o'clock in the morning till about 7 o'clock at night, and I was in a different world. And they were speaking a different language. It was Greek to me. I felt like a fish out of water. I was questioning what in the world did I get myself into. It was, it, it was really a very emotional time for me because I was really starting to question, did I really hear God on this? I was being indoctrinated with terms and phrases that I was unfamiliar with, and, and I saw liberalism, and I just, I was really, really, uh, very, uh, at times, very, very disappointed. In fact, the first week, I got so disenchanted that I called Tammy and I said, honey, I need to get away for a couple hours. So uh, I went and watched the Orlando Magic at a, at a sports bar just to kind of get my, my bearings. It helped a little bit. And then the next week, um, one of the speakers was George Acevedo. And when he sat down and talked with all the pastors, there's probably about 20 of us, it was really the first time that I thought, man, I can relate to this guy. And we speak the same language. And that was 14, 15 years ago. And I'm really forever grateful for his influence, his voice. He's an incredible communicator and author and leader in our nation. And we're honored to play a small part in his life. And we're honored today to have George Acevedo come bring the word. So would you please put your hands together and welcome George Acevedo. <laughs> Bless you, man. Thanks, Go get him. Go get him. Well, it's, uh, it's really, really good to be home. And uh, just grateful, uh, just grateful for this place at Sacred Ground. I'll talk a little bit about that here in just a few minutes uh, as, uh, as we begin. But you have been in this uh, long, year-long series. Wow. You know, I mean, I've done 10, 12-week-long series, never done a year-long series. And uh, love it on the names of God. Think that that's amazing that you guys have been on this journey. And uh, this morning, I want to spend some time with you talking about something that I think is familiar to most of us if we've been in church uh, for a while. If you're new to Belle Isle uh, Community Church, I want to encourage you to stay. It's a good place. Um, and uh, I, want to, I want to share this morning about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one whom we call the Trinity. So one of the first hymns that I ever sang in this church 45 years ago, sitting on the third row, right about over there, right, right, right about where you guys are sitting, right there on the third row, uh, was uh, led to us by uh, Tom Drick with that deep baritone voice, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, uh, God in three persons, blessed, what, Trinity. Now, um, remember, I had been saved about six minutes when I walked into this church, I was still struggling with my addictions to drugs and alcohol and sex. Did I understand what Tom was leading me to sing? Nope. How ironic that 45 years later, I'm standing here trying to explain to you what I sang 45 years ago from the third row of then the Pine Castle Methodist Church. What does it mean for God to be God in three persons, blessed Trinity? Well, let me just tell you one thing for, at the very beginning, that the word Trinity is not even found in the Bible. That's interesting. And yet, the idea and the images of God being three and one and one and three are really crystal clear. And as a matter of fact, if you're a student of church history since the third century, the church has affirmed that to be a follower of Jesus meant to affirm that God is mysteriously three and one, one and three, Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when I was in seminary, uh, my pastor, uh, Howard Olds, uh, he used to say, of the mystery of the Trinity, he said, you know, it doesn't bother me. It might bother you with your intellect. It doesn't bother me because I don't want to worship a God that I can figure out. 
And so we, 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 this is mystery, but what you see clearly in the New Testament and even in the Old Testament are what we would call traces of the Trinity. You see, the biblical writers, they commingle words together, words like God and Father and Son and Spirit and Jesus to describe God's activity in the world, God's activity through the church, and God's activity in our lives. And this morning, I want us to look at one of those rare places in the New Testament text where God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are used together. And I don't want to just consider it in some academic, historical sense. I want us to get some understanding of what does it mean for 21st century apprentices of Jesus who call Belisle Community Church their spiritual home for God to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does it mean right now. It's a beautiful prayer that we're going to look at that's found in a letter that Paul wrote to followers of Jesus in a first century Roman town called Ephesus. Now, two weeks ago, Cheryl and I were in Ephesus. Do you have that picture? No, I sent it. Wow, there it is. There's the picture. There's my beautiful wife, Cheryl. Uh, By the way, 42 years this Thanksgiving, Married right here, that's right. Uncle Charlie, Pastor Yates. Uh, I stole her from this church and you can't have her back. So this is us in Ephesus standing in the amphitheater. Uh, the beautiful story in the book of Acts, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll commend it to you, Acts chapter 19. And uh, Ephesus was a seaport city. It's not anymore. Silt has made it now 10 miles or so away from the Mediterranean Sea. But in the first century, when Paul was there, it was a seaport city. And it was there that Paul went to launch a a church. And by church, I don't want you to think of a church meeting in a high school that's a startup or a storefront or, or has a beautiful sanctuary like this. When I say church, and when you read church in the New Testament, we're talking about a constellation of a network of house churches. There is no church as we know it until uh, after the third century. And, and likely these churches were led by bivocational pastors, meaning they made rugs or built, made tents or they were farmers uh, in the daytime and, and then that their, their side hustle was that they were the pastor of these constellations, the overseers, the elders of this constellation of house churches. And mind you, these letters from Paul were likely taken by Titus and others, and he would go and he would read the letters from Paul that we call the letters in the New Testament. He would read them in these house churches and go from house to house. And and, and, and some scholars think that Timothy, uh, the one to whom Paul wrote two of his last letters, that Timothy might have been uh, the elder at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was this pagan Roman city. And by pagan, I mean pagan. They worshiped Artemis, the god of fertility. And and they had these statues that they would purchase and place in their homes and make their homes places to worship this fertility god. And they did these unthinkable things in the temple that they had built, this huge temple in the city of Ephesus. They had this history, this belief that Uh, years before a meteorite had hit near the city of Ephesus and that when they went to see it, that there was a statue of Artemis. And so then they built this big temple and this whole whole, uh, 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 business industry around this temple was established. And if you read in Acts chapter 19, you'll get the full story. I would encourage you to do that. But this is the context of where Paul was for three years where he evangelized and discipled, that's an important thing, evangelized and discipled the Ephesians followers of Jesus. And so five years later, sometime in the mid-50s A.D., he writes a letter from prison to these friends. And why does he write them a letter? He writes them a letter because he loves them. He'd lived with them for three years. He had been one of their pastors. He had been, if you will, the founder of that church. Now, I just retired after 27 years serving the same church. And I will tell you that, especially on Sundays, I miss my people. Because I love them. 
I, I, I had the privilege of marrying babies I baptized as infants and married them. I buried their parents. I, I walked with them through crisis. And, and that's the pastor's heart that Paul has in, in this letter when he writes this to them. But he also writes them to encourage them. Because let me just remind you that the lure to paganism, to with the worship of Artemis, and all the other things that the Roman uh, culture brought was just as real to them in the first century as it is. I mean, we make fun of those pagan idol worshipers, but we do the same thing. We worship money and sex and power. We just don't make little statues. Well, yes, we do. It's called our boat and our car and our house and, and our, our, our obsession with beauty and youth. These are our gods, and, and Paul writes these followers of Jesus in the first century, and he says, don't bow your knee to these pagan idolatries. This prayer that we're going to look at was a prayer that he prays for followers of Jesus, for apprentices of Jesus, that they would mature and that they would, that they would grow up. You see, we think of Paul as a rabid evangelist, but he was also a passionate discipler. And he wrote these letters to churches because he wanted the people in those churches to grow up. One of my favorite verses of Paul is uh, Galatians 4.19. Where Paul writes, oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. I've always thought that it's interesting that a guy who was a celibate single man would use the illustration of a woman going through labor to talk about what it means to be a pastor. But he says, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And listen to this. And they will continue until Christ is what fully developed. You need to talk back to me. I'm used. I mean, you, you, you're acting like a white Church, I need you to talk back to me a little bit. He, he, he tells him, he wants, I want to see Christ, what? Fully developed in your life. He, he pained, it pained Paul to see that followers of Jesus weren't growing up. And I know your pastor well enough that it pains him when he sees you not growing up. Does me, I told you I pastored the same church for 27 years. And uh, over the years, I, I'd see my folks that, that, that I had helped lead to Jesus and baptize and bring into partnership in our church and walk them through discipleship processes and get in small groups and take classes and all their, go on mission trips. And then I see them, I see them acting immature. I'm going to go, this is only a guest preacher would come and do this. I'm going to talk about politics for a minute in church. Because we're getting ready to enter into another political cycle. Can I tell you what's, what's concerned me about the American church over the last three, four cycles of election, presidential election particularly? And some of you are going to hate me. Send all the hate mail to pastor. But here's what I observed of my people. Maybe, maybe the people at Belle Isle Community Church are a lot more mature than the folks back home in southwest Florida where I live. But I saw more, too many of my folks, I thought, I thought, Pastor, that they looked at politics through the lens of the Bible. And what I found out, particularly the last two election cycles, is that, that far too many of the people that sat listening to my brilliant preaching and teaching every week read their Bible through the lens of politics. And, and friends, please hear me. I think it matters who the president is and all those kinds. I'm a patriot. I'm just not a nationalist. There's a difference. Because I care who's in the White House, but I know who's on the throne. And we, we have our, our allegiance, listen to me, is not to the right or to the left, or even to the center. Our allegiance is to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. And friends, we need this prayer. Again, I'm a guest preacher. I'm going to be done when I get done. I got one shot, all right? So, 
Get ready. So be, before we look at it, let me just a little bit deeper. Why did Paul write this letter? Yes, he loved them. Yes, he wanted them to grow up. But I want to I look at it through a particular lens this morning for the next few minutes. And, 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 and I want to consider that Paul wrote this prayer. It's a prayer we're going to look at. Paul wrote this prayer because he wanted the followers of Jesus then, and I would suggest now, he wanted them to be enthusiastic disciples. Would you say those two words with me? Enthusiastic disciples. He wanted them to be enthusiastic disciples. And we're looking at a prayer. It's Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And I'm a bit of a, a word nerd. I love the origin of words. And I want to look at the word enthusiasm for just a minute. Could you put that slide up? This word enthusiasm is uh, two Greek words that are pushed together. The word en, which means in, and theos, which means God. So literally, the word enthusiasm means in God or what? Full of God. Paul prays a prayer here in Ephesians 3 for followers of Jesus. He uses God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and he says, I want you to be full of this Trinity God, three and one and one and three. So that's the question. For the next few minutes, I want us to look at is, how can I be an enthusiastic disciple, a full of God disciple? And let me suggest three insights, and yes, you've guessed it. We're going to talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So here it is. First, I can be a full of God follower of Jesus when I pursue, when I pursue the Father. Say that with me. When I pursue the Father. I was thinking about it this morning. You know, Pastor said he, he called an audible. I want to call a little audible. If you're taking notes, you could write next to the word pursue. Maybe even a better word is the word submit. When I submit to the Father. I can be an enthusiastic follower of Jesus when I submit to the Father. Keep reading with me the next verse, verses 14 and 15. Would you put that up on the screen there? Let's read this together. Ready? Go. When I think of all of this... I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I have you read with me so I know that you're awake, all right? I know that you're not sleeping. So what is the this in this verse? When I think of all of this. Well, if you read the chapters earlier, Paul has written and boldly declared about an incredible truth. That if we surrender to Jesus, we are saved by faith. Uh, through the grace of God, not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. But then he says, but we were created to do good works. So we're saved by grace, but we're saved for works. And then he goes on to explain that this saving grace is for everybody. I, I, I hate, Pastor, that the more liberal progressive folk have stolen this phrase that is biblical. All means all. Jesus is for everybody. Okay? He's for everybody. All does mean all. Uh, by the way, all of this craziness around human sexuality, the, the problem is, is that some folk are talking about salvation, and we're talking about those of us who believe what the Scriptures say about sexuality, about sanctification. What is it that God requires of a saved person when it comes to their sexuality? And it's different for a follower of Jesus than it is for everybody else. So we're not talking about salvation. Salvation's for everybody. All does mean all. And, and, and he, he says uh, to these followers of Jesus that the this that he's talking about is that this saving grace is for everybody and that it brings peace, not just with God, but peace with each other. And with this in mind, then Paul, he hits his knees and he begins to pray and he prays to the Father, the creator of heaven and on earth, the first person of the Trinity, the Father. And there's two things that he says about God in this addressing prayer. First, he calls God Father. Now, Jesus had introduced this radical idea. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, he said, when you pray, you pray our what? Our, our Father. He said, you pray our Father. And this was kind of unthinkable among the Jews. They were very careful about the names of God. You've been Studying them and without in any way diminishing, hear me, the Old Testament and even some of the New Testament images of how we understand God. Jesus introduces this unthinkable way of thinking of Yahweh as being like your papa. 
like your daddy, like your father. In the Greek, it's the word pater, but in the Aramaic, ah, in the Aramaic, it's the word Abba. First, second time I was in Jerusalem, Cheryl and I were in the, the, uh, the, the gift shop at the Jerusalem Museum. And this little Hebrew boy bumps up against me with tears streaming down his face. And he's got his arms like this, and he's walking around the gift shop, and he's saying this, Abba, Abba, Abba. And I just lost it. Because that's the one to whom Paul prays. That's the one to whom Jesus said we could pray. He is Abba. He is this all-loving Father. But he doesn't end it there. Again, look at the text. He's, he's the Father. He's Abba. But he's what? The creator of everything in heaven and on earth. So to all loving, Paul adds, this, this God is not just Father who's loving Abba. He's also, he's also all powerful. Far too many of us, by the way, what? kind of keeps us stunted in our faith is that we just want Jesus to be our boyfriend and baptize all of our bad decisions. And we forget that the God that we serve is holy. So don't allow your intimacy with God to interfere with your awe of God. And so Paul prays to this God who is all loving and all powerful and these two truths about who God is, leads him to bend his knee, to fall to his knees. It takes humility, it takes reverence. And here's the deal, you can't be on your knees and stand over anything or anybody. Paul's physical posture here reflects more of an internal posture. And his first century hearers in Ephesus got this because they were living in Ephesus under the thumb of Rome. And in Rome, it was required that whenever the Romans asked, you had to hit your knees and you had to declare, Caesar is Lord. Some of us are doing that, by the way. That's all the whole elections thing. I'm going to leave that alone. See, Paul points to an all-loving and an all-powerful God who invites us to fall to our knees, not by the power of the sword, but by the power of the cross. And on our knees, we declare that Jesus is Lord. So my question is, is your God, the God that you fall to your knees for, is he both all-loving and all-powerful? Is he your loving Abba to whom you run when you are afraid and your holy creator to whom you reverently worship and to be an enthusiastic, full of God disciple, he has to be your father. Second thing. Second way for me to be an enthusiastic disciple of Jesus is when I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. Say that with me. When I am empowered by the Holy Spirit. And let's read verse 16 together. It's up on the screen. Verse 16. Ready, go. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Let me just add this. This is not in my notes. You, you all, y'all messed with me when I was 20 and went off to college. I, I thought every United Methodist church was like this one. I'm just telling you. They didn't have the Holy Ghost in most of the churches I went to in Kentucky like this one. So, But that's neither here nor there. I, I love that Paul adds to the prayer that to be a maturing follower of Jesus, you have to be empowered by the Spirit. Another word for empowered is infused. Infused. Have you seen all around Orlando these infusion bars? There's a certain segment in, in, our, in our population that will spend $100 to $300 a session to have an IV of vitamin cocktails infused into their body so that they can feel better. Uh, there's an unnamed person that, might, that I know pretty well that I did his wedding, uh, oh, a couple years ago, and uh, he, let's just say he had a little bit too much fun at his, uh, at his wedding party. And, uh, uh, and, the night bef- and the day before his wedding, he had one of these infusions, and it, I mean, it actually works. It actually works. It, he felt better. He was infused 
with vitality and, and new life. And I'm not picking on this groom. He's a good guy. I'm just suggesting to you that likewise, we need an infusion, regular infusions of the Holy Spirit because church, the Holy Spirit leaks. Can I get an amen? I mean, if you, want, if you don't believe me, if you follow Jesus, if you're an apprentice of Jesus, just go spend 30 minutes on I-4 during drive time. I mean, if you love Jesus, the Holy Ghost will leak out of you in those 30 minutes. Because, see, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the truth, confronts sin, embodies us with the character of Jesus, or, or what we call the fruit of the Spirit, gives to us capacity, supernatural capacities for ministry in the church and in the world called the gifts of the Spirit. And we need this kind of infusion, spirit infusion, if we're going to grow in our apprenticeship to Jesus. And that's why Paul describes this Holy Spirit power as being glorious and unlimited. You see, I have limited power. And you have limited power. It means you're going to run out of you. But God, Paul writes and prays, can give to us his limitless power in our inner being so that we have inner strength that is at work within us so that if you are a follower of Jesus, one excuse you can't have for acting immature in your faith is, I couldn't do anything else but that. You, you, you don't have the excuse of saying, I couldn't, Help myself. I mean, the problem was the Holy Ghost leaked out. You weren't staying infused. Just two chapters later, Paul would write in Ephesians 5.18, one of the first five Bible verses I ever memorized as a Christ follower. He says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do not be drunk with wine, for that's useless, he said. He's comparing small s spirits with big s spirit. And it doesn't just say, hey, one time get baptized in the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues, and then act like the devil the rest of your life. Some of the meanest people I've ever met have been spirit-baptized people. But that's not what Paul says in this verse. He says, Ephesians 5.18, write it down. He says, be filled and keep being filled. Keep getting infused with the Spirit of God. And if you're going to be an enthusiastic disciple, you need a regular infusion of the Holy Spirit. I wish I could spend more time on that, but I'm not. Number three. Number three, I can be a full of God apprentice of Jesus when I am established in the love of Jesus. Say that with me. When I am established in the love of Jesus. Let's read verses 17, 18, and 19 of Ephesians chapter 3. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So all of all of the fullness of God. So Paul has said we bow our knee to the Father, check. We need to be filled with the Spirit, check. And now he goes to the second person of the Trinity, that we would be rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus. So Jesus gave that parable, you remember, at the very end of the greatest sermon that's ever been preached, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and Jesus ends and he talks about a house being built on a bedrock solid foundation or a house being built on sand. And Paul uses the image here of being rooted and grounded, and he says we're rooted and grounded in love. Last year, uh, where I live in southwest Florida, our church was ground zero of Hurricane Ian. And we had five, uh, $7 million worth of damage done on our three campuses and, uh, uh, and somewhere around $80 billion done in the state of Florida. But worse yet, a loss of about 130 lives in, in our community. And we discovered uh, when that hurricane came through, which houses were built on the rock and which ones were built on the sand? And likewise, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to have pressure 
into our lives and pressure is God's gift to us to test us to see us whether we're rooted and grounded but I love what Paul says here it's rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus he goes all GPS on us he says the breadth the length the height the depth and some scholars think that what Paul might have been doing is saying to Jewish followers of Jesus you think the temple in Jerusalem is big with his depth and breadth and height and I mean They say you could light an oil lamp and raise it to the top and it would illuminate the whole city of Jerusalem. By the way, that's when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, of the cosmos, not just of Jerusalem, not just of Israel, not just of the world. I'm the light of the whole cosmos. Regardless, Paul is trying to say something here about how immense the love of Jesus is. We sang about it. In the songs this morning, I'm no longer a slave to fear. All of that is love. Pastor John tells us that that it was was love that he was sensing in church this morning. One commentator says this of the love of Jesus. It, the love of Jesus, it is wide enough to reach the whole world and beyond. It's long enough to stretch from eternity to eternity. It's high enough to raise both Gentiles and Jews to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's deep enough to rescue people from sin's degradation and even the grip of Satan himself. I'm glad that 45 years ago, as a lost kid raising hell in this community, that the height, the depth, the breadth, and the length of Jesus reached even me. It is the love of Jesus. And I came by this morning simply to testify that 45 years ago, when I walked into this church and sat on the third row, It was the expansive love of Jesus through so many of you in this room and for so many who have gone on to heaven that transformed my life. What what, what, what won me to Jesus in this space was not great preaching, though we had it, and great music, though we had it, and great ministry for students, though we had it. What reached me was ordinary people who were in love with Jesus, and it overflowed to this addicted, want-to-follow-Jesus teenager kid. And... I felt the embrace of my all-powerful and all-loving God through your embrace. I experienced the power of the Holy Spirit for deliverance and healing in my life through your prayers. It was the space and the place where God met me. And it was the place and the space where God wants to meet so many of us, even today. Paul ends his prayer, Paul ends his prayer with this glorious doxology where it's like he puts a beautiful bow on it. Would you look at the next verses with me where Paul prays, now all glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish what? Infinitely more, infinitely more. And we might ask or think, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You see, I'm also here to testify 45 years later that God has proven himself to be this kind of God who is able to accomplish infinitely more. For the last four and a half decades, I've watched God use my life As an alcoholic and a drunk in recovery, he's matured me and grown me by his grace. He's used me, and I've gotten a front row for the last four and a half decades at watching Jesus turn addicts into adorers. I've watched him turn mean people into kind-hearted people. I've watched him turn folks who were addicted to money and sex and power, other kinds of addictions that we don't talk about, and turn them into generous, extravagant, selfless women and men. Almost 30 years ago, God gave me the opportunity to take a church that had 
300 people in it, which is not bad, but it had 600 about two years before. My first day there, I, Pastor, we had $29.16 in the checking account. We owed $1.2 million on an interest-only note that we were paying with the balloon coming due in another year. $20,000 worth of unpaid bills. And 30 years later, by the grace of God, we're debt-free, $4.5 million in the bank, three campuses reaching thousands and thousands of people for Jesus down in southwest Florida. And only God, listen to me, this is not about me, only God, it is the God who can accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Every time I'm invited to come here, I want to remind you, Belle Isle Community Church, your greatest days aren't behind you. They're not behind you. They're in front of you. Because we serve this kind of God. So, some of us need this prayer for our life. So what I did is I turned the prayer and I made it personal. I think it's on the back of the message notes that you got, but it's also on the screen. And I turned this prayer into a personal prayer. As a matter of fact, you might save this and put it in your Bible. So let's stand together. and We're going to pray this prayer over ourselves. This is not being selfish. The Word says that we're supposed to love God and love ourselves so that we have capacity to love our neighbor. Some of us got the order of God's love wrong. We've been trying to love others without really appropriately loving ourselves. And this is a prayer of appropriate love for self in the presence of the God who loves us most and best. So let's pray this prayer together, church. Father, I pray that from your glorious, unlimited resources, you will empower me with inner strength through your spirit. Then Jesus will make his home in my heart as I trust in him. Let my roots grow down into your love and keep me strong. Lord, may I have the power to understand, as all your people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep your love is. May I experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then I will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from you. Now all glory to you, O God who is able through your mighty power at work within me to accomplish infinitely more than I might ask or think. Glory to you in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now friends, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, today would be a good day, right? Pastor and I are here. We want to pray with you. If you're, if you know that you're not maturing in your faith like you need to, you've heard the call. Determine today. Determine today that you're going to be a full of God, full of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and walk with Him. What that means is you can't be casual in your discipleship. Coming to church when you want, serving when... No, it means I'm going to follow Jesus. And this is a great place to do that. And you have a great pastor to do that with. Amen? I love you. It's been good to be with you, Pastor. George, excellent. Wasn't that fantastic?